Welcome back, everyone, and we're going to turn it back to Mike, and we're going to hear about feral hogs. Correct. Commissioners, our next presentation will be provided by Mr. Alan Larry. Good morning, Alan. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and provide you an update on our feral hog program. All right, so here in Missouri, we have a very strong and productive partnership in our battle against feral hogs, and I've listed the members of the partnership here on this slide. Uh, the, the Conservation Department leads this partnership. Uh, one of the reasons I think this partnership has been so productive and, and so successful is because all the members have the same goal and they're dedicated to that goal, and that is complete elimination of feral hogs from the state. We don't have members that would be satisfied with just controlling damage. We all want them completely gone. We also partner with some of the agricultural groups, and I've listed a few here. There's certainly more than that, but I couldn't get them all on a slide, and I didn't want to forget any, so I just listed a few. Um, these, some of these organizations have provided funding for us to use to purchase equipment and also for outreach efforts, and they've also, some of them have published articles about feral hogs in the journals that they send out to their membership, and that's very been very useful. That's an outreach audience that we wouldn't have the opportunity to reach otherwise. So around the end of uh, 2016, the partnership decided we needed to develop a strategic plan to guide our efforts. We realized we'd been very reactive up to that point. Uh, we would assist landowners if they would call and ask for help, but we didn't really have a vision on how to get to where we were going. So we needed to get a proactive approach, and we also wanted to develop a plan so all of the partners were focusing their resources in the same area and we were using a cooperative effort so we could be as efficient as possible with the resources that we had. So uh, we completed the plan in 2017 in time for the 2018 or the fiscal year 2018 budget cycle. We submitted a request and the Conservation Commission funded that request. So we started implementing the strategic plan uh, on July 1st of 2017. And this is a page out of the plan. This, uh, the yellowish gold uh, shapes represent the elimination areas that we've designated and they're numbered. And then the red circles or shapes represent the approximate distribution of feral hogs at the end of 2017. And the blue shapes represent the approximate distribution at the end of 2018. So uh, a part of the plan was that we designate the elimination areas and then we also tried to determine how many full-time trappers we might need in each of those elimination areas to be successful at eliminating feral hogs from the state, and that's what drove the uh, the request for the, the budget request. Do you have that same map for prior years? We have it for a, for a couple of years back. We don't have it as, as detailed real far back because we didn't have a lot of staff working, you know, real seriously at the effort going real far back. We, but we do have, we're working with the United States Department of Agricultural folks right now to try and develop some of that to try and compile the information that we do have as far back as we can go to show that. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully the second part as we go forward, we're going to see the, the shrinking up to about 2017. It was probably a, a steady expansion, and now hopefully, and that's kind of where we're headed with this slide. Um, this particular slide is, a, is kind of starting to show results. So this is a blown up uh, version of Elimination Area 1 from the last slide. And one of the reasons, there were several reasons why we... Uh, chose this to be Elimination Area 1 and why we numbered the other ones the way we did. And one of the reasons this one rose to the top was because almost all, if not all, of the public land in this elimination area is owned by the Conservation Department or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And both of our agencies have banned hog hunting on the property that we own, and that's a huge help to our trapping efforts. Uh, it's definitely a detriment to our trapping efforts when we have folks uh, disturbing our trap sites and, and, and running the hogs away from areas where we're getting them consistently coming to bait. So this slide shows uh, that we're starting to see progress in Area 1. As I mentioned on the last slide, the red uh, shapes indicate the approximate distribution of feral hogs at the end of 2017, and then the blue shapes indicate the approximate distribution at the end of 2018. So you can see quite a reduction in the distribution just in one year. 
Another example would be um, from January 1st of 2018 until the end of March of 2018, we removed 347 feral hogs from this particular area. And in the same time period, January 1st until the end of March of 2019, we only removed 93 hogs from this area. And that's with the same amount of effort and we removed less than a third. And that's just because there were less hogs to remove. The, the staff that are working here on the ground in this area are spending a lot of time trying to find hogs now because we've gotten it down to the point where there's not that many left. Another example in our... Um, Alan, hate to yes. interrupt you, but just for purposes, I think, of, of Commissioner Orschland to perhaps explain also how, how do hogs get in these different parts of the southern part of the state as well? Maybe explain how do we believe that we, we have these populations to begin with? Yeah, we believe for the most part that you can see how they're spread out. They're not, it's not an expansion like this, and that's because we believe people are intentionally releasing them. They're wanting to move populations to create new populations to hunt. Why drive four hours if you can have one, you know, close by? Uh, of course, nobody wants them in their yard, so the, the distribution follows fairly closely to where the public land is in the state because that's where people are going to want to put them because no private landowner is going to want somebody to... There's a penalty for doing that? There is. Yes, there, there is. And uh, there's regularly in the legisl legislature, there's proposals to maybe increase the penalties. Um, there's def... Um, where are we at now, Aaron? The, Mr. Com Commissioner, the legislation was passed during the 2009 legislative session. It was part of uh, Governor Blunt's executive task force. Uh, the legislation that made its way through the General Assembly and eventually to the governor's desk um, made it a class D misdemeanor on your first two releases that you got caught. And then on the third one, it was a uh, class D felony. Uh, given that these folks can load up a, a bunch of hogs in a trailer, and dump them out on Forest Service land in a matter of minutes. It's extremely difficult to catch these individuals. Uh, the, while it was a good attempt uh, to put legislation on the book, uh, it's also very complicated legislation. And uh, that's one of the things we want to work with the Department of Agriculture on in the coming years to straighten up the legislation that's out there right now to make the fines stiffer uh, and then clarify some of the language in the bill. Okay, so another uh, example, and I don't have a slide for this, but in Elimination Area 2, which is around the Fort Leonard Wood area, Pulaski, Phelps County area, where there's been a lot of hog activity and we've done a lot of trapping there, we have a graduate student that is just finishing up her research, and her research involved uh, trail cameras, and she's trying to develop a method for us to better determine occupancy. These maps were made from staff. Uh, you know, knowing where hogs are, but she's trying to help us develop a method to get more accurate. And she put uh, her cameras in areas where there have been tra hogs before, but we've captured a lot of hogs. And she had out 264 cameras and only 26 of them, or about 10% got hogs, uh, got photographs of hogs. So that shows that we are, we've been pretty successful in that area as well. The ha cameras weren't ex directly um, associated with previous trap locations, but in the same general areas. So here's a look at the statewide numbers. Uh, these numbers are for all of the partners. These aren't just Department of Conservation folks or uh, USDA folks. This is all of the partners as well as some other cooperators. And as I, meant, as I mentioned earlier, the, the strategic plan first was implemented on July 1st of 2017. And by the time the cooperative agreement was signed and staff were hired and they were put on the ground, we were pretty much getting into 2018. And you can see how the numbers went up quite a bit in 2018 and, and we're seeing very good numbers so far this year as well. So that's positive. Um, and that's despite the fact that, I'm sorry, sir, go ahead. looking at a trend of 12,000. Yes, sir. In the in some of the areas over like in Area 4 in the southeast part of the state, there still are definitely a lot of hogs over there, and the numbers there are going up. But as I showed you on a previous slide over in Area 1, they're going down. So we were we first staffed up as, as staff came on, and they were kind of staggered as we brought them on board because the U.S. government was under a hiring freeze, so they were only able to hire several at a time. They went into Area 1 first, 
and then we staffed area two and we moved through like that. So we're definitely further ahead in area one. The numbers are still going up over in area four and area six, but hopefully soon we'll be showing a different stat and it will look like the previous slide with area one where numbers are going down. Like having six balloons in a swimming pool. You're trying to keep them all underwater. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's a good analogy, sir. Yeah, so, um, and as far as, as how many staff are working on this, uh, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the APHIS folks through cooperative agreement with uh, MDC and other agencies as well as some of, the, as well as some of their own funding, they have 28 staff that are full-time working on feral hogs. 26 of those staff are trappers, and two of them do some trapping and do some administrative. Then MDC, we have at least 30 staff that spend um, a decent amount of uh, a, a good percentage of their time on hogs as an additional duty to their normal work and then some others that spend a minimal amount and then we have one full-time staff that works just on hogs and then we have two hourly staff that uh, spend most of their time on hogs and then other agencies in the state do not have anyone dedicated just to working on feral hogs but they do have staff that put some of their time into working on feral hogs so uh, an idea of the dollars spent during fiscal year 18 by the department, you can see it was about $2.5 million. And the $1.8 million cooperative agreement with the United States Department of Agriculture is in the equipment and expense line here. So one problem that we still do have is, inter or that we do have is interference with our trapping efforts. And one obstacle here is the fact that the US Forest Service still allows hunting on the Mark Twain National Forest, and there's 1.5 million acres there. Uh, the Forest Service is currently working hard uh, with the help of MDC and others to try and um, get a regulation. Uh, they're trying to pass a regulation to uh, limit or uh, eliminate feral hog hunting on their property. And that will be a very big help for us for our efforts because when there's trapping going on on the forest, we see disturbance. And then even on neighboring properties, this was on private property, but sometimes the hunters uh, start hunting on Forest Service where it's legal for them to hunt and then dogs do what dogs do when they're chasing animals and they get off they don't recognize boundary lines and this photograph was on private property near Forest Service land and you can see the dogs got in the trap and, and they weren't able to either weren't strong enough to lift it or they didn't understand how the trap works so one of the guys had to get in to lift the dogs back out of the trap so it will be really a big deal if the Forest Service is able to pass this regulation. It will be really helpful for our efforts. Disease is a big concern for the agricultural industry. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture does the disease sampling in Missouri. Uh, their goal is to take 100 samples per year from the state of Missouri. For the three years I have listed here, they, they, they took 95 samples in 2016, and then they got 100 in 2017 and 2018. The three primary diseases that they're sampling for throughout the nation are pseudo rabies, classic swine fever, and swine brucellosis. And so on this chart, the percentage of positives out of the 100 or 95 samples is on the left side and then the year on the, on the bottom. Now actually to the agricultural industry, there's three diseases that are even more important than, than these, and those would be PEDV, which stands for porcine epidemic diarrhea virus and PRRS, or PERS, which stands for porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, and then African swine fever. And in the United States, the most economically significant of those is the, the PERS, and that's estimated that it costs the domestic swine industry in the United States $664 million per year, or $1.8 million per day, approximately. And then, um, and the globally, the African swine fever is the biggest concern, and that has not been detected in the United States yet. But that disease is at least a million deaths of domestic swine is attributed to that disease at this point, and potentially as many as 10 million. It's hard to know for sure, but the estimates, estimates range anywhere in that vicinity. So it's a concern uh, if that would happen to get into the U.S. domestic swine or in, in feral hogs in the United States. And then I just wanted to mention some of the outreach efforts that we have going on. I think the outreach is extremely important. I think it's been really important in getting the program to where we're at at this point, and I think it's going to be very important as we move forward to continue to educate the public and, and others in the state and, and keep them aware that feral hogs are a concern. And as we do start to see success, 
uh, we still need to make sure those people remain vigilant and that they're aware that this is still a big problem and if we uh, get complacent that it could come back. So our o &E staff, uh, uh, and, and we work together real closely to come up with some of these things and we, we try to hit a variety of different things. They have radio, uh, they have television, they have um, newspapers and stuff. They have the fancy terms print media and digital, but I didn't want to try and dive into that. I might goof some of that up. So they're trying to get all the different uh, venues here and try and reach all sorts of different people and and they have a, a term for how many people actually hear it or listen to it I don't remember that either but this is going to touch a lot of people with this campaign that we have going so um, we even have billboards we had billboards a couple summers ago and I think that was effective obviously we have to keep it to a minimal number of words we don't want to put a paragraph on there if people are driving 70 miles an hour but just to remind them that feral hogs are a concern that I would try to answer any questions that you might have commissioners Questions, comments? Commissioner Murphy. Thank you for your report, Alan. Do you have any sort of an estimate as to how many people participate in hunting feral hogs in Missouri? We do not. No estimate at all. Um, and I think that it would be a huge difference between the, I think there's a relatively small core group that, that really, really enjoys it. They're, they're really into it. They're a member of the, you know, some of the organizations and stuff. And then I think there's probably a little bit larger group that, you know, are kind of casual. They go out with some stick. Or yeah, a yeah, exactly. But don't some of the ones that are very serious about it, you know, they own dogs, they train dogs, they, they are they're They do it pretty seriously. Thank you. Commissioner Bedell. Since we've closed the border in our areas, have we caught anyone dogging in them? Maybe that's a question for Randy. Protection. <clears throat> have you gotten any assistance from the National Park Service? I know you have them listed. My understanding was they were kind of waiting for the Forest Service before they closed the Park Service. That's correct, Commissioner. They 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 provide assistance in helping with the trapping effort and that they're on board with this, but they are um, in step with the Forest Service as far as closing to hunting, as far as closing their property to hunting. So you can still dog in the National Park? Yes, sir. So when you trap a group, do you get 100% of the group or just, I mean, I think of a, I, know, I think I have an idea of what the cage looks like. I saw a picture, but do they all get in there? before it shuts or do you just get part of them it's variable and the reason that trapping is the most successful successful way to eliminate them is because we can be successful at getting the whole group but we have various styles of traps the the, the nicest and the most expensive has a, a live feed video to a cell phone so if the guys know how many hogs are in the group they can watch on their cell phone from anywhere on the planet and they can wait until the entire group is under the trap and drop it Others that are triggered by the hogs themselves, it varies. You know, the, the older sows are going to be slower to come in than the piglets. But the guys get creative in how they set the corn in there, and they'll maybe put some corn under the trigger with a, with a cedar branch over it. So the little ones that go in early are feeding elsewhere, and hopefully by the time they find that last little bit and trip the trigger, the whole group is in. Uh, one of the USDA guys actually caught 62 hogs in a trap, one trap, one night and it was one that the hogs dropped the trap themselves it wasn't one that he had control so he did a very good job of hiding that trigger i guess but they're out there the hogs are very smart but our trappers are very smart as well this is what they're doing all the time and they get very good at it and they're constantly adapting because the hogs are constantly adapting the roughly 3300 that we've uh, gotten rid of uh, through march that's without any helicopter work right no, the USDA helicopter was here some yeah, in January and February. Yes. Are they shooting? Yes, their helicopter is shooting. Yes, sir. <clears throat> How long does it take if you use the, the trap one time? Do they have to move it? No, they can leave it in the same place. There seems to be varying opinions on that, but, but a lot of the staff think they can reset it in the same area and it's fine. Because I'm curious. Those things are very smart, and I'm just curious if they see their brother 
in that pen whether or not they're taken off into the next county. Well, that's definitely a concern, and that's why we, we hope to get the entire sounder the first time the trap springs, because otherwise they do get educated. And that's another bit of a concern. We were uh, talking with some others yesterday about the, the, the 2018 Farm Bill and, and how they're going to distribute money. And that's a bit of concern if it just goes out to landowners without some education, because if you get folks that are um, untrained at trapping hogs and you have a bunch of people out there putting traps and they're putting them too close together and stuff, we may be educating the hogs rather than than catching them. So we may be making our job more difficult if we don't, you know, get it done correctly. One thing you mentioned is trying to get the word out is that you have four radio stations, I think, spots on four different stations. Where are those stations? I th yeah, I think that's campaign is in southeast Missouri, and then the from the tailgate television one is in southwest Missouri. So there, we're we're trying to target all parts of the southern part of the state mainly. Then some of the stuff on the Brownfield network I think goes statewide. That's a radio campaign as well. I think Heather's shaking her head back there. I think that's a statewide campaign. Do you have any openings for shooters out of helicopters? <laughs> we get a lot of volunteers for that. <laughs> I'm really, really cheap. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll keep that in mind, Commissioner. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Alan, I just want to point out, as a soybean farmer, um, Gary Wheeler and his team just put this great article out about feral hogs in this last, last magazine and really appreciate your outreach efforts in, in incorporating the ag industry and our, all our other partners. They have been critical in helping us in this and just wanted to recognize them for some of the great great coverage they've given us. Great. So, thank you and thank the O&E staff as well. They, they're certainly a huge part of that. O&E. 